With Cold Steel 3 one month away, I can now officially count myself as one of the many who are now completely prepared for its release. Over the past year, I've played five of the greatest games I could ever hope to find among the JRPG Armada, starting with Trails of Cold Steel, moving on to Trails in the Sky first chapter, second chapter and the third, and finally finishing Trails of Cold Steel 2 earlier this year. However, these are the games that have been officially released to a Western audience, localised by Xseed and brought to us on a slew of platforms. The adept members of the Trails fandom will know that these five games do not represent the full pre-story to Trails of Cold Steel 3, as there is a final duology of games set in a small autonomous state of the continent. This was the final piece of the jigsaw before I could delve into the latest localised game, and though it wasn't as easily accessible as the other titles, I was able to emulate the games with relative ease. Of course, I'm talking about Zero no Kiseki and Ao no Kiseki, or Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure. Up until starting Zero no Kiseki, I believed that I had seen everything that the Trails series had to offer. I was confident that the shocks and revelations I had experienced in previous arcs would never be surpassed. After finishing Ao no Kiseki, I can say, without any hesitation, that not only is Zero no Kiseki in my top three Trails games, but Ao no Kiseki stands at the summit as my favourite game in the series. And that's why I want to share this with people who are hesitant to start this duology of games. I want to show you why, as a fan of Trails, you owe it to yourself to play these gems. The Crossbell games introduce us to a junior detective, Lloyd Bannings, who has just returned from his detective examinations and has now been drafted into the books of the Crossbell Police Force. It's not long before Lloyd finds out that he is to be part of a new team of junior investigators, a special support section, who have been brought together to improve relations between the police force and the citizens. Along with three other members, Randy, Tio and Ellie, it's not long before the four are thrust into their first test, an extermination of the monsters in the man-made Geofront, where the player finally is given the reins. From looking at Zero no Kiseki and the aforementioned Al no Kiseki, you'll notice that the game sports a similar design to its predecessor, Trails in the Sky, with an overworld that the party can freely move around in, complete with various monsters placed around the area. Upon coming into contact with one of these monsters, the game reverts to a familiar grid-based layout and takes on a combat system that many Trails fans will likely be familiar with. A timeline on the left-hand side will give players an overview of what special events are due to take place in future turns, be it a critical hit, additional sepif drops, or in some cases, instant death. Upon seeing the best course of action, the player can utilise their attacks, crafts and arts to try and find the most optimum outcome. However, to prevent the combat system from feeling too familiar, Trails from Zero adds its own small quirks to make the combat fresh, in this case the potential for team rush attacks, which sees the group unleash a flurry of melee attacks in the defined area. The chances of the team rush can also be increased by either attacking an enemy from behind on the overmap or by finding in-game items that will increase the frequency of the event. The Crossbell games also introduce the ability to attack enemies on the overmap, allowing for even greater advantages, and you'll notice that this was later moved over to the latest Dark Trails of Cold Steel. Now even though the combat is simple, I'm personally a big fan of games maintaining a similar style like this, as it allows the player to transition seamlessly from one arc to the next. Small continuous evolution of the system ensures that players are still on board based on their own knowledge, but also keeps the system fresh so that it doesn't become too grating to play through. I've seen it so many times when the newest and shiniest title of a franchise tries to reinvent the wheel by ditching all previous foundation and ultimately falls flat on its face when the new system simply doesn't work. Final Fantasy XIII After traversing the Geofront, defeating a relatively simple boss and being saved by a badass, the special support section are led to their headquarters for the course of the two games, and from here the group of junior detectives are free to help the citizens of Crossbell. It won't be long until you're introduced to a terminal where all support requests are submitted to the SSS, and it falls to the discretion of the player as to whether they wish to do these fringe missions or simply move on with the main story. Quests that will advance the plot will be marked as required, whereas the aforementioned side quests will simply be listed should the player wish to do them. And my god these side quests, they are fantastic. The side quests from the Crossbell arc in my opinion trump anything offered by the Sky or Cold Steel arcs. 
First of all, the side missions play on the paradigm of investigation and deduction. Yes, there are missions with the simple run to this location and kill X enemy for your reward, but a sizable number of them will require you to partake in work befitting of a detective group. You'll have to question large groups of individuals, find clues that can lead you on to the next point of interest, and in some cases make choices based on the evidence that you've gathered to make a final decision. These were a breath of fresh air as they not only allowed me to get into a mind of a potential criminal, but also made sure that I paid attention to the information I was being given. One of my favourite side tasks involved investigating thefts at various food stalls around the city, and based on the pattern of movement and their actions, I could deduce not only where they were most likely to attack next, but also the most likely motive behind why they committed the crimes in the first place. It's fulfilling to take in all that information and then come up with a plausible solution, and the game rewards you with extra detective points for doing so at the end of the chapter. However, there are also a lot of wholesome and humorous side missions spread throughout the game as well. For example, requests that require you to find the perfect present for a dear sister, setting up a date for a guy who's fallen in love with your receptionist, or reuniting an estranged father with his son and new family. There's plenty of variety for players to get their teeth into here. As for the second reason why I thought these side missions were so rewarding though, it relates to the character arcs and stories that are either continued or concluded from completing said quests. Crossbell in itself is a rather volatile city and it's constantly in a state of flux. That volatility, needless to say, also affects the citizens within its borders. You see characters who have fallen on hard times in maybe Trails from Zero, and by completing support requests for them in Aonogaseki, you're able to add some form of closure to their despair. However, it's not just the Citizens of Crossbell stories that get fleshed out in these games, as previous events from the Sky Arc in particular are also continued in this set of games, and one in particular felt oh so satisfying to finally see concluded, especially after knowing what this particular individual had done to a certain family in the Sky games. Had I not chosen to do the side missions, I would never have experienced that sense of elation. I mean, how often is it that a side quest from a completely separate game, may I add, continues a supporting character's arc? I can't think of any other game off the top of my head that does this, and it's just a really neat feature that the player can get that satisfaction and closure should they choose to put in the extra playtime. Now, optional quests are all well and good, but how about the main story, the events we'll be playing through for the course of 100 hours or so? Is this actually a story worth putting your time into? Well, put it this way. I came into the Crossbell duology with my hype levels through the proverbial roof. I had heard of so many other fans who told me without any doubt that Crossbell was the best arc in Trails. And we've seen it all before, where you get so excited for a game that the ultimate experience just ends up letting you down. No Man's Sky, anyone? Will you be able to play with your friends? Yeah. <laughs> Though I was excited, I was also somewhat anxious that my hype for Crossbell would dampen my enjoyment in the end. After playing through the games, I found that my initial worry evaporated faster than you can say KFC Bargain Bucket. Zero and Al not only met my hype levels, they surpassed them right out into the stratosphere. To give you an idea of how much this overall story left an impression on me, I've recently done a video on my top 10 Trails moments prior to Cold Steel 3, and a fair few are from this arc. The story is masterful, it's full of shocks, revelations, twists, and payoff, and though I don't want to spoil too much for you if you've yet to play the games and you intend to do so, I do want to give two main reasons why I feel this story is so successful. First of all, let's look at the cast of characters. As said before, the game centres around a group of four known as the Special Support Section, composed of Lloyd Bannings, Tio Plateau, Randy Orlando and Ellie McDowell. The group comes together practically at the beginning of the game. You make your way to the Crossbell Police Station, get introduced, and off the group goes. This is one reason why I feel the main cast of the Crossbell arc resonates so well with the player. In Sky, Joshua and Estelle start their journey and eventually meet more colleagues as the events unravel, whereas Cold Steel indeed has the group of Class 7 together very early on, but for copious amounts of time, Reen is free to travel around the campus alone, interacting with who he wants. By bringing these characters together at the start of Zero, it gives the character arcs a lot more time to develop, and it also gives each of them time to shine in their own way. Each member of the special support section has their own reasons for joining the team, either looking to answer questions of their own, to become stronger, or simply to escape from their troubled past. 
Throughout the journey, the SSS will also engage with other characters, either major or minor, and it adds far more flesh to their backgrounds as you start to understand their reasons for joining the police. The developments of their arcs feel natural, flow well from chapter to chapter, and needless to say, I felt engaged with every single one of them from start to finish. It also has weight that the SSS truly feel like a team. They initially start as a group of friendly acquaintances, but as they start to progress as a group, you get to see the growth of each member as they all look to support each other. Deep interactions between characters feel deserved, as each member deduces and learns more about their peers, allowing them to go beyond being a simple colleague to one another, offering advice and emotional support. However, the cast of playable characters doesn't stop with the SSS alone, as a slew of other members from the Bracer Guild, Crossbell Police and Guardian Force also become available, assisting the group with some of the more pressing matters. It's this interaction between the SSS and the various other parties that starts to increase your understanding of the state of Crossbell, the struggles that said parties have, and it also starts to build a network of information between the various groups, which feels very much like what a detective group would be doing in the real world. I don't say it lightly that this cast of characters are so diverse, so endearing, both main and supporting, that they have been my favourite in the series thus far. However, characters only make up half of what makes a story so good. The other part for me is the location itself. What makes this location so special compared to others in the series? In other games, Cold still sees you travelling around Erebonia, while in the Sky Arc you're travelling around Labelle. Both of these states are not only far older than Crossbell, but also far larger. In those games, it's not uncommon to be travelling around the landmass from city to city in order to gain knowledge of the lay of the land. It's Falcon's way of introducing you to some of the key areas you'll be involved in for future events. Zero and Al, however, do not have this. Your base is the SSS building. You are stationed in Crossbell throughout the entirety of both games, because quite simply, there's not much reason to hike from populated area to populated area. Crossbell as a state is not only far smaller, but the city itself is right in the centre of the country, meaning a bus in most cases is sufficient transport to get to each area. It means that you're always in the midst of the action, you don't hear about far off issues that you can't possibly get involved in, and it gives the games this atmosphere of constantly being on edge. The pressure is always high, and it feels like the metaphorical balloon could burst at any moment, which in many cases, it does. However, the location of Crossbell is not the only reason why this land is so volatile, as the games place a heavy emphasis on politics. Though Crossbell itself is autonomous, it's stuck between two superpowers in Calvert and Erebonia, who are both vying for supremacy in what is ultimately the financial centre point of Samuria. The method in which Crossbell was birthed also presents deep international problems, something which the SSS starts to discover as the games progress. They start to realise that the orthodox methods of maintaining order simply don't have an effect in a land with as much political strife as Crossbell State, and ultimately the only way to combat this is by creating an unorthodox method to overcome said barriers. It's brilliant to me because this feels very real. You're not preventing international coups or awakening ancient powers, you're watching the complex nature of international relations and politics take centre stage, and it's exciting. Trying to understand the goals of international leaders, what plans they have manifested in the shadows, and ultimately what they intend to do with Crossbell was easily the biggest driving force that pushed me forward. Again, this brings me back to that word, pressure. pressure. It's without doubt the best story I've played through so far in Trails. It did everything right. The ambience, the pace, the characters, the land itself. It was all mixed together into a beautiful formula for success. I've been singing the praises of these games for a while now, but not every game is infallible, and the duology does have a couple of issues that some fans have commented on to some degree of frequency, which I thought I might make you aware of. One of these issues relates to the initial pacing of Zero, in that the game starts relatively slow, which is somewhat similar to what Trails in the Sky first chapter suffered from. It's only from chapter 2 onwards that the game begins to pick up the pace. Now while I do agree the start is slow, I would ask the question, what do you expect? Think of this thematically. 
You're a new team of young investigators, a team which has been drafted together at the opposition of the main police force. You have no experience, no credibility, and many other parties, including the majority of your peers, consider you to be a joke, or worse, an insult. It's only natural that you start slowly, but as you progress and get involved in the more pressing matters surrounding Crossbell, the other groups start to recognise your worth. You earn that credibility by your actions, and after you gain that trust, you're delegated responsibility over some of the more sinister events. You literally start from zero and make your way up over the course of the games. So, thematically, this does make sense to me, and for that reason, this never really threw me off. However, the second thing we're going to be talking about was a little bit of an issue for me, and it relates to the speed of gameplay, and more precisely, the combat. I can't deny that, especially in fights, the game feels quite sluggish, and this isn't a frame rate issue, I mean literal slow animation and visual effects that linger for a little too long. I don't know if this was an issue for the PC port, but it definitely was an issue for myself on a PSP emulator. I did have the option to speed the game up to something like 200 frames per second, and I would use this option quite frequently just to skip through the battle at times. I don't think it's any coincidence that the later localised forms of Sky and Cold Steel incorporated the turbo option. But hey, this is a minor nitpick and doesn't detract at all from the experience, it's just something I thought I would mention to other players. But in all honesty, that's all I have. Two minor nitpicks which to many people won't even be an issue, and that truly speaks to how highly I regard these games. Quite simply, the Crossbell duology is a masterpiece, and represents the best storytelling I've experienced in Trails so far. The games filled in so many gaps that I had from previous entries, it concluded the stories of characters I had grown to love over my previous experiences, and it took me into its own universe to show me one of the best narratives in JRPGs. I spent nearly 120 hours playing through these two games, and they flew by. I can't remember the last time I sat down for hours on end to play a video game. It just doesn't happen much to me anymore, but the Trail series, and especially Zero and Owl, reaffirmed my love for the genre and video games in general, and I want more people to experience that same feeling of elation as I did. I can't recommend these games enough, and now is the perfect time to get into the Crossbell art, as the guys at Geofront have almost completed a full translation of Zero no Kiseki a fan translation that I am confident will be the best version for Western fans for years to come. I implore you as well to show your support to Falcom if you can. Buy the physical editions, even if you can't play them. Show your thanks to Kondo and his team for putting so much care into these games. Show your appreciation to Falcom for giving us the greatest JRPG series ever. Now go, a new adventure awaits. Until next time guys, I'll see you later.